So it's 4 o'clock, and I think we will start. Because, uh, there will be actually another class after that, but I talked to the people, so they will not be disturbed by so it will be a little longer, wouldn't matter, except for the students. Actually, somebody wants to take up after uh, 5 o'clock. We completely understand if you have other engagements. Welcome, everybody, for the second um, year in the restoration seminar. And I'm really excited to start this season again because we had two very successful uh, seasons with very good speakers. And I think we just keep doing this and invite uh, all the good uh, experts in the region. And I would like to welcome uh, Josh Vincent today, uh, who came to talk to us about the German Gulch a restoration project. And before he starts his talk, I would like to just read a little CD also for the students to have information of uh, what he has been doing. So Josh Winson is the vice president and a principal engineer of the Water Environmental Technologies. He's a co-founder of Water and Environmental Technologies, uh, a civil and environmental engineering consulting company headquartered in Butte. His experience encompasses a wide range of topics, including contaminated site investigation slash remediation, hydrogeologic in investigations, water quality evaluations, uh, assessments, land development, environmental permitting, stormwater and uh, wastewater infrastructure design, and Superfund site cleanup. WET provides professional services to a wide variety of municipal, industrial, and private businesses, clients across the Northwest region. Josh graduated with a degree in environmental engineering from Montana Tech and is registered professional engineer in the states of Montana and Wyoming. Josh is also actively involved in numerous community public service and conservation organizations and loves living in Butte and Southwest Montana. So somebody from Montana Tech, you really are welcome to come to us and share all your good results and ideas. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Uh, welcome, everyone. So it's always fun to come up and uh, talk to students and faculty and stuff about some of the some of the interesting projects that are going on around Montana. Uh, so this uh, kind of a neat little project. First of all, um, Robert, this is a, an hour, roughly 50 minutes. Just um, wave. I 50 minutes is kind of our limit. Okay. We do a little bit over. Yeah, I, I can talk all like day. <laughs> When these guys start get oh you want to leave a few minutes for questions okay if, yeah yeah, yeah. Good, that would be great. okay wave at me if I'm going too long so um, anyway this is a neat little project that uh, our firm was lucky enough to get to work on it was a project that was founded and kind of run through the George Grant chapter of Trout Unlimited for those of you that are uh, unaware with that organization, they're uh, the local chapter of State Trout Unlimited and have been very active in the, uh, you know, the Southwest Montana watersheds and fisheries over, shoot, 40 years. George Grant uh, really founded the group back in the 60s and 70s when they were trying to put what's called Reichel Dam in on the Big Hole River and he fought to uh, keep that dam from going in and out of that effort kind of spawned the the early days of the George Grant chapter of TU. So um, I've been involved with that group personally and then our firm got involved with this project. So uh, natural resource damage program project. And so I'm gonna kind of run through, um, this thing was done. Gosh, it's, it's really gone on for a long time. Um, early stages in the early 2000s through, really we didn't finish the last little pieces of it until uh, last year. So kind of take you through the major pieces of it and uh, talk about some of the challenges we had and some of the different pieces of uh, restoration work we did and um, just kind of tell you about it. It's kind of a neat little project. So um, real quick, George Grant mission, uh, Trout Unlimited mission, preserve, protect, and restore wild trout fisheries. Um, this is sort of their operating range, and, and these are all, a lot of these are very famous wa um, fisheries and watersheds, you know, the Big Hole, the Beaverhead, the Jefferson, but, you know, most people have written off the Clark Fork due to Superfund impacts, and what's neat is that this project really is a um, kind of a foundational piece 
to really spawn the, the restoration of the, the larger uh, upper Clark Fork watershed because this is a really key tributary to um, getting the fisheries restored. So, um, so why German Gulch? Well, um, it has a native West Slope cutthroat trout fishery and uh, really, you know, between here and, uh, you know, the, the confluence, the beginning of the Clark Fork at, at Warm Springs uh, really is the, the best and the healthiest of all of the tributaries. There's several others, Browns Gulch and, you know, Mill Creek, Willow Creek and Sand Creek and uh, Blacktail Creek, but most of them are, are pretty severely impacted either via you know drought or dewatering or um, heavy metals contamination and and German Gulch I mean although it has its uh, challenges and, and impacts as, as we'll talk about really on the grand scheme of things was in pretty decent shape and had a pretty healthy tributary so really uh, the idea behind this project is you know, when we started this in the early 2000s, there were no fish in Silver Bell Creek, and the idea was is let's protect and improve German Gulch, and then when the tailings are removed in the main stem, that these fish can then move down, they'll naturally move back into the main stem and help repopulate Silver Bell Creek, and to a, to a large extent, I'm not a biologist, fish biologist, that's, that's happened, that's coming to fruition. There's all the cutthroat that you're seeing in Silver Bell Creek now, they're coming from German Gulch, so. Um, Great location from a, an access standpoint, almost 100% publicly owned. There's a few little mining claims in there, and we were able to purchase a few of those and uh, turn them into public land, but um, you know, lessened the issues with landowner agreements and whatnot. And um, really, it has some uh, very unique cultural resources. Uh, it's been placer mined, and, and we'll talk, and I'll show you some photos and stuff on that. Um, so we call this our backyard trout stream. So just to give you an idea, you know, here's Butte, here's the pit. Uh, you know, here's Opportunity Ponds and Anaconda and German Gulch just kind of sits uh, right up off of uh, Fairmont there. You don't even know it's there. You kind of buzz right by it. And uh, it's kind of a neat thriving little uh, West Slope cutthroat fishery right in there. So um, this is a little bit more of a zoomed in uh, look. So this is looking south. Um, sort of southwest, that's I-15 heading towards uh, Dillon, but you know, we've got the, the main stem of German Gulch here, a um, couple of major tributaries, Norton Creek and Beef Strait Creek, and then this is a problem that we'll have to deal with at some point too. That's the Beale Mountain Gold Mine that's up at the, the upper end of the uh, drainage, but anyway, that's kind of uh, German Gulch. It's about five miles total from the, from the upper end uh, down, down to the mouth. So. So what was the problem, uh, and why did we go after this project? Well, um, there is some there was some impaired stream function. Uh, the, the, it hadn't been heavy metal mined, but it had been pretty heavily placer mined. So the Germans were in there in the 1860s, and then the Chinese came in after the Germans worked it and worked it again. Um, and what it, you know what they've done is they just they changed the stream geometry, straightened it, and, and basically mine out all the fines, so there's nothing but, but large cobbly type uh, material. And as a result of that, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of vegetation impacts. Um, there were some uh, areas with mine waste due to running a rail spur up there that they built out of mine tailings. Um, even though it's almost all public publicly owned, the ability to get there was very difficult because there were a couple of private claims at key locations and uh, there was really no, no access to it from the Silver Bowl Creek corridor. So um, we wanted to work on that. Um, there was a connectivity issue at the bottom. Um, so the lower few hundred feet of German Gulch would get dewatered due to an irrigation diversion. And uh, we had a lot of entrainment of fish into that head gate. And again, um, some private claims along the bottom that, that as recently as like while we were doing this project, we would go up there to do some of our work and there'd be guys in there plaster, you know, gold panning and stuff. And there were rumors that some of, this, some of these claims were gonna be put back into, uh, you know, into active mining. And so the, the urgency to buy those claims was pretty high at the time. So, um, so talking just briefly here, here's a, kind of a typical uh, uh, placer mining operation so you can kind of see what it does to a healthy uh, you know, 
functioning floodplain and stream. It pretty much rips it apart. So um, there were actually three separate mining camps in German Gulch at one time. Well, one at the mouth, which is actually the old town of Durant. If you go through there now, there's still a couple old buildings there. And then there were actually two other ones further up, which you get up there, it's pretty desolate. Uh, you know, those old miners were, were pretty tough. So. Um, and so they, they did leave their mark on the on the environment and and you know there there were some impacts to the the fishery so uh, so you know out of Superfund comes opportunity that's that's the way um, I like to look at it as an environmental engineer you know we we have all this uh, you know impacted you know mining impacted landscape but you know, the Superfund process afforded, uh, you know, a lot of ability to do restoration work and to help put some of this stuff back, uh, you know, into productive use. So, you know, you, I don't know if you guys, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the history, but this is sort of the history of the, um, you know, Superfund in the upper Clark Fork. So 1983 state lawsuit and, uh, you know, and then the Natural Resource Damage Program was created to basically litigate that, uh, suit against ARCO and there were multiple settlement agreements and uh, so this 1999 settlement agreement was for the Upper Clark Fork and it set aside 130 million dollars and so the NRD set up a grants program for really anybody to come forth with good restoration projects and so the the chapter George Grant chapter got involved and really was passionate about this uh, watershed uh, you know Pat Monday a lot of you guys may know Pat Pat was involved with Trout Unlimited back then and he sort of he said hey we should do something in German Gulch and then this thing just sort of got got legs and and turned into a pretty uh, pretty significant project by the time it was all over so um, you know they had funded over 120 projects uh, through that program so so well, I got ahead of myself. Well, there you go. So this thing started in 2002. So uh, you know, we're we're it's been a long time. This was done for the local chapter. So some of these names you may not recognize, but um, some of the group uh, chapter uh, folks know these guys. Ron Spoon, you know, he's been over in the Jefferson for 10 years now, but he was over here at the time and helped us get get this project going. Uh, so we were able to get a couple of smaller project development grants to uh, put this, you know, go out and collect the data that we needed to do to figure out how to, how to get this project done. And then in 2005, um, we wrote a large grant of about, you know, just over a million dollars and got to work on that thing in 2006. And we got, we got a big chunk of it done early, but then, you know, as I'll talk to you, uh, you know, a lot of challenges dealing with all of the different regulatory agencies and landowners and um, you know the technical part was actually kind of the easy part the <laughs> doing some of the other stuff sometimes is is much more difficult so a um, few things we had to coordinate with DEQ doing their cleanup through the uh, through the corridor and, and we actually didn't finish the last pieces of it till last year so um, but it was it was uh, it was a nice project because it didn't just do one thing. It sort of was a, a little bit of a holistic approach to handling a bunch of different things in the watershed uh, together. So, uh, so these were kind of our six primary uh, goals of this project. It was a it was a pretty uh, aggressive project. It took on a lot of different things. Really, in essence, it ended up being like six different projects all kind of folded up into one. So. Uh, but wanted to improve West Slope cutthroat habitat and channel stability and uh, improve upland habitat, revegetate these placer tailings. Um, there's a lot of weed problem up there in German Gulch we wanted to address. Um, we wanted to provide public access, really no access up into there. Um, so goal four, this is kind of a, a fancy uh, name for, we. German Gulch needed water, basically, and so we looked at a couple of different things for uh, getting a sustainable water source and connectivity with Silver Bow Creek, as well as um, putting a fish screen in and keeping head, fish from being entrained in the head gate there. And then we wanted to purchase some mining claims and all do all of this while somehow, you know, preserving and uh, calling attention to the, some of the cultural resources there. So. Um, I apologize for this. I'm sorry. I'm not going to spend much time on it. That's was kind of our project map. The blue is uh, fish, wildlife, and parks. The green is forest service. So you can kind of see 
This is the main stem uh, coming through here. So a as you can see, it's great because it's almost all publicly owned. So uh, that's, that was one of our big, big pieces. This is kind of down Fairmont, and that's the rancher that we worked with on the water lease. And um, so that's just kind of a bird's eye view, but I've got some better photos. So first thing, how are we going to address the stream channel impacts? And so, um, you know, really very straightened, very, you know, shallow channel, really no real habitat for the fish. I mean, very limited. And so what we wanted to do is see if we could improve uh, channel habitat, spawning habitat, um, you know, maybe some overwintering. So kind of put it back the way it was prior to being placer mined. And then we also wanted to try to revegetate the floodplain to see. So uh, what we did is we did a pilot reach. So there's probably, I think I said about five miles of, of German gulch impacted, but we obviously didn't have enough money to do the entire reach. Plus some reaches that were not in as bad a shape as others. So what we did is we went to like one of the worst reaches uh, and we did a pilot reach on about a quarter mile of stream to just kind of try this out, see if we can put it back and see how, you know, try some different strategies of revegetating in this uh, real cobbly floodplain. So, um, so we did this work in 07, and then as I'll show you, um, had some very interesting, uh, Mother Nature didn't help us out on some of these things, and it, it's kind of some of the things that you run into when you, uh, when you do restoration work is, Desolate plans don't always go uh, according to, to plan. So anyway, so we ended up making some repairs on it, but but it's held up pretty good since. And uh, so anyway, so this is kind of at the upper end. Uh, this little orange reach was where we did our pilot reach. Now we had to play some 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 tricks here because if you do, uh, it's all forest service. But in order to do anything like this on forest service, you'd have to go through a whole NEPA analysis and. A, environmental assessment that would have drug it out even longer than it already did. So we had purchased these claims and what we did is the chapter purchased them and then we went ahead and did this pilot restoration on them while they were still private and then we didn't have to go through the NEPA analysis and then when we got done with it, then we turned it over to the Forest Service. Forest Service actually recommended that we do that. They're like, yeah, we'll never get it done if you wait for us so you should just just do it on your own, uh, do it when it's your property and then give it to us. So um, so this is kind of what it looks like, guys. I mean, it is just, these are, you know, it's a far away photo, but it's nothing but cobbles. Um, you know, there really aren't any finds, no topsoil left, it's all been mined. So um, so we came in here, uh, you know, the, the stream, if you go back, you know, the stream was all pushed all the way over up against, right against the hillside there and you couldn't even see it. So. Part of this reach was to, you know, we took it out and we put it, put it back into its floodplain. Um, you know, we were able to haul in a little bit of fines to try to get some vegetation to take, but really, uh, you know, couldn't afford to haul in a bunch. So um, we had some, you know, we had some kind of unique ways of, of trying to get vegetation to take where we had to, to get it uh, uh, taken without hauling in, you know, 10,000 yards of soil. So. Um, Here's another look. This is kind of looking upstream. So you can see we kind of took it off the edge. We kind of put it put it through here. Tried to incorporate some woody debris and stuff uh, with some of the local streams. Transplanted some vegetation uh, from the old channel to the new channel. So um, all in all, generally turned out turned out pretty good. Uh, but these were the things we kind of learned. Um, and this first one, we, we figured it out ahead of time uh, or we, we could have been in trouble. So as we were doing the design, it's like, it's a placer mine system and it kind of, the channel itself kind of seals itself off. But we talked to some other um, biologists and some professionals where you take a stream and you throw it in a, a cobbly substrate, the stream just disappears. It just goes underground. So we ended up hauling in uh, bentonite from the local pit there out in uh, um, right there by Fairmont. And we lined the bottom of the channel to kind of hold the water in there. We still did see some water loss, but uh, generally it held up. And then by the first high water, it kind of went through and sealed itself off again and, and haven't really had any issues um, since. And so, you know, we did this 
you typically do your, your stream restoration projects either early in the spring before runoff or you do them late in the fall uh, during low water conditions because it's easier to work with. So we did this in the fall of 07 and uh, you know, lo and behold, spring of 08, you always kind of cross your fingers on a stream project and you're like, you know, I, I don't really want a huge event the next spring. Well, we got a huge event in 08. I mean, it was like a, I think it was a 32 year event. I think that's when they were doing Milltown. So it was a, it was a big, big event. And this thing ran out of bank for like almost eight weeks and we're like, oh man, you know, what, what are we gonna do here? So. Um, so we did end up going back and having to, there was a couple of places that, that blew out that we had to kind of go back and fix, but generally it held up pretty well. So um, this, is, this is what it looked like in the spring of 08. So, uh, you know, we had water everywhere, but in, I mean, it was in the channel too, but it was pretty much everywhere else as well. So, um, and we had, we had done a lot of revegetation work there as well. And so that kind of, set us back a little bit, but at the end of the day, it kind of washed a lot of these seeds and, and you know, shrubs. If you go up there now, it's pretty impressive. I, uh, I didn't get a chance to get up there. I wanted to run up and get some updated photos, but, you know, there's vegetation that's, you know, it's come back pretty well since then. So, so anyway, that was the stream restoration piece. So basically we determined that, yeah, it, you could put it back, you could revegetate the floodplain. Um, you know, better, or not a better way, but a, a cheaper way to do it really that we found out too is, is, is just fence it off. Um, so very steep valley and the Forest Service has a couple of um, grazing leases up there and they just, they don't get those they don't get those cows out of the bottom and they just sit in the bottom and they just they just tear the bottom of it up so we ended up fencing this off and you could i mean stark difference between what we had fenced off and sprayed for weeds versus what was going on outside of that so um, we'd like to get more of that fenced off in the bottom but uh, anyway so the second second deal was to improve upland habitat and the uh, best, uh, biggest piece of this was there was about 7,000 yards of actual mine waste that was hauled in and it was all part of this um, rail spur that went up, went up from Silverboat Creek that used to serve the town of Durant and these other mining camps. So um, we went in there and we're going to remove those. Uh, we also, weeds were just awful up there and so we did employ some biological weed treatment up there, NRD. Uh, doesn't like to pay for chemical treatment. We did end up um, through through DEQ ended up getting quite a bit of chemical treatment done up there as well, and knocked them way down. Um, and then working with the Forest Service to try to, you know, get them to do a better job of of managing some of the grazing leases. And so we got them to fence. We fenced our section off, and you know didn't make a whole lot of headway on fencing other reaches, but still something that probably needs to get done there. So, so this is the old town site of Durant. So this is kind of right at the mouth of where German Goats and Silverboat Creek come together. So you can kind of see the mine tailings there. Um, again, you know, and these kind of ran right up along the stream as well. So every time it rained, they washed right into the stream. So they were, you know, they were loading metals in as well as sediment. So, they were a problem and they weren't, you know, we knew that the DEQ was gonna come through there eventually. Originally we were gonna do this on our own, but then we started started thinking about it and the logistics of it are, I mean, it's really tough to get at. So we, we just talked to DEQ and we said, hey, uh, why don't, we're gonna give you this much money that we had in our grant and then when you guys come through and do the main, the main stem, you just run up and grab our tailings and pull them out and that's what they ended up doing. And so it worked out, it worked out pretty good. So, um, yeah, so challenges of this, this particular piece, uh, you know, the access was very, very difficult. And so that's why, in, in, you know, ultimately we decided to let DEQ kind of, they were the big hitter coming through there. So we let them negotiate easements and access for us. Um, you know, the other challenge was, is, you know, we got this approved in 05 and 06, but DEQ wasn't gonna get there until you know, I think they went through there in 14 or 13. So, you know, time costs money and uh, DEQ was gracious enough to say, yeah, we'll take what you got and do it anyway. So it, it ended up working out, um, it ended up working out okay. So, 
Uh, so this is sort of, so this is a recent Google photo. So this is actually revegetated, but you can kind of see this is the access road in, but the tailing spur ran all the way up and it actually crossed the creek right here and then kind of up, up into this flat area up there. But so that, that's like a, that's right after DEQ got done and had it revegetated, but the, the, you know, it hasn't taken yet. So that kind of gives you an idea. Um, so it was fairly extensive in the lower end of the stream. So public access, this is another big piece. So uh, the only way to get into German Gulch before we did this project was you could come in on the forest service um, at the upper end that crossed it, but there was no trails or anything. The lower end, there was this bridge. And if you were gutsy enough, you could try to negotiate that and get up into the, uh, into the, uh, the watershed. But uh, I actually took a vehicle over there a few times and then I finally got too scared to go through it. So anyway, so we wanted to basically replace this bridge uh, with something that was, was you know, access public friendly. And then we built a trail up the, uh, up the gulch and connected it with the Forest Service uh, trail network on the upper end. So. Um, and so this was gonna, so this spurs off the Greenway and they're still working on it. I think they're almost done, but you can take the Greenway Trail, get off, get on German Gulch, go all the way up German Gulch, get on the Norton Gulch Trail, Norton Creek Trail, that's Forest Service Trail, and it'll take you all the way to the Continental Divide Trail. So you can, this was sort of a connecting piece. So, um, so it's, it's good. So we did, a, it was a pretty low impact trail. So, um, so we ended up uh, going out and, and buying a rail car instead of putting a big fancy bridge is. We went and bought a rail car and kind of worked it over, welded handrails on it and put some new abutments in. There were abutments in the stream that were kind of impacting flow a little bit and just poured a couple of new abutments outside the, the high water mark and uh, uh, put this on. And so we actually had another pretty neat piece going on. So. Um, there was a crossing halfway through and we had an, uh, an Eagle Scout that we got involved in the project and he, that was his Eagle Scout project, is he uh, put this footbridge in and it was two and a half miles in, I mean, it was a long ways in. So, um, but the, the kind of the neat part is, is so we bought three mining claims from this family, the Layton family. And uh, this David Layton was one of the first guys, um, you know, his grandpa, patented the claims or great grandpa and then the the father owned them and worked them a little bit and so the children had them and you know they nobody lived in Montana anymore they live in California and Colorado and parts abroad and so we approached them about buying these claims and they were you know they were pretty conservation minded and wanted to 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 do it and they actually uh, you know they sold that property for pretty pretty reasonable, like $1,000 an acre. We bought 82 acres for 82,000, which to me was, that was a good deal. So, but to recognize these guys and doing the right thing, cause they, I mean, those could have turned into hunting lodges or, you know, whatever, been mined or whatever, it's beautiful up there. Um, we recognized and, and so we kind of dedicated that footbridge to his dad and we did a big event we invited the whole family. They all came up when we uh, when we got it done, and we did kind of a little ceremony on the bridge. So it was a pretty it's pretty cool deal. So um, so that's kind of the the trail. So it runs basically right from the mouth there, and we have two kind of parking areas. One's the Forest Service Norton Creek Trailhead, and the other one is um, we've got a trailhead down at Silverboat Creek, and so there's our new bridge. So you saw the old one. This one's quite a bit nicer, wouldn't you say? Uh, so, and it, it's got, it's gated so that pedestrians can get through, but there's no vehicle access because that's actually game range up there. So uh, no motorized access anyway. And here's our little, uh, you know, our little parking area. It's nothing fancy, but it, it just gives the public a way to get in and access that. Um, here's some photos of our trail. Uh, kind of hard to see here, but um, runs right along the creek. It's a beautiful trail. Um, I'd highly recommend it. It doesn't get used that much, uh, but it's about three miles, I think, a little over three miles, and it's it's pretty uh, pretty gradual hill. Um, it's mostly along the creek. It kind of jumps up into the upland a little bit, so it's it's a neat neat trail. Some people take their bikes down it, but I think it's a pretty technical bike ride. Um, so here's our footbridge. 
So we got the sign there. It's the David, you know, the David Layton Memorial Bridge. So that was the day we did the uh, the ceremony. There's Andrew McElroy was the um, was the guy. He's a local Butte kid and did a great job hustling that in. And that's the Layton family. So they all came back and uh, we did kind of a neat little ceremony for them, and they they appreciated that. So um, challenges. So. Yeah, just getting a hold of people, very difficult. <laughs> you know, three people in three states. Uh, you know, the trail, getting it approved and public land was very difficult. Um, the bridge was a little more expensive than we thought. Um, we were able to make that up by using the Montana Conservation Corps to help us build the trail, so we were able to save money there. Um, really, the thing I pulled my hair out the most on was trying to get a maintenance agreement on the bridge and the railroad crossing. So you had Forest Service, FWP, NRD, DEQ, Butte Silverbow, the Greenway Service District. Uh, you know, there was like a dozen groups that you had to get this. It took like a year to get the agreement done before we could put the bridge in. But just little things that you don't always think about when you, you think these projects are going to be easy. So, um, so let's move on to water. Looks like I'm, I'm tracking OK time-wise. So. Um, this was a real challenging piece. This was the, definitely the most challenging piece of the project. So uh, it had three pieces, really. So we wanted to put a fish screen on the uh, diversion that's right at the mouth of German Gulch. And I'll show you some photos. Um, terrible for fish entrainment. I mean, the fish literally come down the creek and have no choice but to swim right into this guy's diversion. They have to take a 90 degree turn and go through uh, a head gate to not go down his ditch. So, um, and then uh, we wanted to get a water lease with this guy because in low water years, his his head gate's about oh, 300 feet up from the mouth, and he would take the whole stream. He would board up the little side channel, and he would send the whole stream down his ditch. So obviously, it it there was no connectivity with the main stem and. A lot of fish going down his dish and uh, ditch and being fertilizer. So um, we figured we could get two CFS of water was about the appropriate amount to be able to keep that channel wet. Uh, we worked with Ron Spoon and, and Jason Lindstrom to figure out how we could, you know, get make sure that the fish could get up and down there um, in the low water years. And then in order to replace that 2CFS, we drilled him a couple of wells out on his property, which is actually was better for him anyway, just because this, you know, this head gate was three, four miles away. Granted, it was gravity versus pumping wells, but the well systems were right on his place. And he had a, he's got some really rickety uh, flume that he had to, uh, that leaks really bad and that he was always worried about. Uh, caving in on him. We actually fixed a piece of his pipeline that was falling in the creek and um, kind of improved his, his irrigation system significantly in return for this water lease and the fish screen. So, and then the last piece was we wanted to put a fish barrier. So being that it was a native population of West Slopes, uh, we didn't want them hybridized. So rumors of you know, ra you know, rainbows and cutthroats will hybridize, and some rainbows, you know, down lower on the Clark Fork. So we wanted to protect this population. It's a pretty common uh, way that FWP protects West Slope strains is by putting a barrier down at the bottom. So we threw that in there as well to protect the West Slope uh, cutthroat population. So, so this was pretty. This was pretty challenging. So uh, this was the. His, his irrigation flume, that uh, his pipe that was basically, I don't have any pre-photos, but this pipe was like just suspended over the water, like ready to fall in at any time. And so we were able to go in here and put some gabions in and kind of shore this up for him. And uh, so here's our, some photos of our screen going in. So um, we put in a uh, FCA farmer's screen. There's a bunch of different you can kind of hand, you can you can custom make them, and then there's several um, kind of patented types of fish screens. So this is a pretty cool, pretty cool screen. Um, it was kind of a new technology at the time. We learned a few things about it, um, but 
And then this was a by, this was the bypass channel that was going to provide the uh, so basically we backed up his head gate enough to push water over this side channel that provided the two CFS of water for the fish to pass around. So that's your discharge pipe uh, for the fish screen. This is his head gate. So um, we put this on, but but German Gulch Creek basically flows right like this, and then. The creek, the fish, you know, have to come down. They have to go through here, and then the stream would continue down. And when he gets low water, he boards it up, basically. So there's no way for these fish to get, you know, anywhere but in his ditch. So we did some improvements on his head gate and made this easier for fish and for debris to pass. So here it is with some uh, water in it now. So this is looking downstream. So it went down his uh, ditch here, and then it went into the screen. And so the screen, basically, the water comes in, and uh, look, I'm looking upstream. So it comes in here, and th this, this is a screen. And so the water falls and passes through the screen, comes up over boards, and then goes down his ditch. And then the fish get funneled down and kicked back into the stream via that pipe. So it's kind of a neat little, uh, neat little deal. But real challenging because we needed two CFS and we could barely get him that with his wells, but you need enough, you need extra bypass flow in enough time to get, to get the fish back in. So we actually needed a little more than two CFS and so we kind of, we played with that quite a bit. But, um, so these are the things we learned with this. So this, this fish screen, which looked like a really good deal, um, we put this thing in and what we found is it was plugging. So the screen, you know, the water is supposed to go through the screen. Well, you know, it was just what, what would happen is, is the small debris in the stream would start to stick on this. And pretty soon, you know, it would, it would plug the whole screen and then, the, and then it would overflow over the top and then it would start to wash stuff out. So we had this uh, fish screen guy back about two or three times until we finally figured it out. We actually had a because of the hydraulics and the way it came in is we had this standing wave right at the front of the screen that was basically just like throwing this debris down on the uh, down onto the, the, the top of the screen and plugging it. We ended up making some adjustments to that uh, entrance and, and it just kind of just went away overnight. So uh, the well piece, getting them water was very difficult because it was a closed basin. Uh, the upper Clark Fork's a closed basin for new water rights. So what we did is we traded his surface water right for a groundwater right, uh, but that's not as easy as it should be. So it, it, it was complicated. It took us a couple of years to get all the water rights uh, done on this, but we didn't, um, and we didn't quite, it was just, it was just pretty difficult. <laughs> we ended up getting it done. It seems like it should be simple. Water rights in Montana, especially new appropriations and closed basins, are very, very difficult to get, but we were able to get it done. We worked, uh, Trout Unlimited has a water, um, it's called the Montana Water Project, or they've got some attorneys that do nothing but work on um, water leases and water projects and stuff, so they helped us out and uh, we were able to get this thing done. And then the fish barrier, we ended up making a change. We were gonna put the barrier on um, German Gulch Creek, but at the end of the day, talking with Lindstrom, Jason Lindstrom, and DEQ and everybody, we ended up moving, putting our money towards a larger barrier on the main stem of Silverbow Creek. So the idea was, is there aren't many fish in Silverbow Creek, let's try to restore it as a native fishery of all West Slopes. And so the, our money went towards a larger barrier downstream. So, and then we had another uh, fight with uh, Mother Nature when we put that fish screen and bypass channel in because we got another huge spring event that, that caused us some problems, but we were able to, to get by that as well. So that's, that's what happened. We put all this in and then we got, we got this kind of an event. Um, so you saw what it looked like nice and low water. So what happened is we had water spilling over his, you know, the, the kind of man-made channel anyway. And so we ended up having to come back in and rebuild some of this and fix up our bypass channel, but it's functioned well since then. Um, so here's the, this is what was happening to the screen. So this is looking down on the screen and you can see that it would start here and then this debris would just move its way down and just stick to that screen. And so the, 
the irrigator was calling us and he's like, man, I gotta, I gotta sweep this thing off every, you know, two days and you gotta help me fix it. And so we were able to, we were able to get it fixed for him. So um, he had a significant amount of, of maintenance up there anyway, but, but we got that figured out too. So, and then the barrier, might be kind of hard to see, but this is Main Stem German Gulch Creek. This is Silver Boat Creek. So, you know, there was a little bedrock um, outcrop right here. We were going to put that barrier right here, which was about a half a mile up. And instead, they ended up moving it down to Main Stem Silver Boat Creek. And this is what it looks like now. They just finished that last year. It's a massive structure. And uh, I don't know what that costs. This was a photo of it going in. This was kind of a Google Earth photo, so you can kind of see. They had the, the channel in a pipe here when they were doing the work. So that's the forms for all the concrete that went into that. It's a pretty major structure. So, and you can walk right up and see that from Fairmont Road. So, uh, okay, mining claims. Uh, as I said, we bought three mining claims, 82 acres, and there were water rights associated with that. So that was the other thing I didn't mention on how generous his family was to, to sell us his property because they were old water rights too. So um, that was very significant. So that could have been taken and we could have had more water problems than we already had. So we turned around and we donated um, two of the parcels to the Forest Service because it was surrounded by Forest Service and we donated the other one to FWP. Um, we've got our trails running through them. And so anyway, that was pretty, pretty straightforward as far as this project goes, the mining claims. So here they are. So we bought these two claims and then we bought this one. This one's a really sweet claim. It literally, that is the property where Norton Creek, Beef State Creek, and German Gulch Creek all come together and there's cliffs on both sides. It's a really beautiful piece of property. Um, that's like one of the cliffs right there on the property. It's a neat, neat spot. So, and then the cultural resources is kind of a small piece, but basically we had to go out and identify what was out there as far as cultural resources and not impact those in, in our activities. So this is an example of a bunch of Chinese walls. The Chinese built these rock walls when they did the placer mining. And uh, so there's, there's lots of those all over the place. Um, so I've never really understood historic preservation. Um, they want you to avoid, you'd think you'd want to call attention to some of this stuff, but a lot of it they'd say, well, no, we don't want you to get anywhere near it because we don't want anybody messing with it. So we had limited um, ability there. The trail runs by some of these and it's kind of neat to see, but um, a lot of cultural, um, neat old stuff going on up there. So won't spend much time on this. This was just the budget. Um, so it was a, a little $1.05 million project, about 875,000 in restoration money. And George Grant, little old George Grant, was able to come up with about $175,000 of our own matching funds. So um, we wrote, we got grants through, uh, we got a future fisheries grant. We got a grant from FWP for the fish barrier. We got a, a grant for the fish screen. The Montana Fish and Wildlife Conservation Trust helped fund the land transfers, and then George Grant donated some cash and a bunch of uh, in-kind contributions. So very, you know, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of partners, and that's what really made it kind of happen. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's the list of acronyms, so <laughs> I won't spell them all out, but the environmental business is an acronym heavy business, but really, all of these folks, you know, helped out in some way, shape, or form, helped make something happen, helped with a deal, gave us money, um, pointed us in the right direction. So it was very, um, you know, difficult at times, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, all everybody bought in, which made it, made it work. So, um, yeah, so there's our goals, you know, save West Slope cutthroat trout and uh, provide fishing opportunities for our kids. And the problem is, is there's still, still issues up there. So these are some things that, you know, I'd like to see the chapter move forward on. And we've already, um, you know, talked to some, you know, Forest Service about some of these. So Beale Mine, it's a big problem. It's frankly a ticking time bomb up at the top end of the watershed because they were owned by Pegasus, who anybody that's in the mining business knows, Pegasus went bankrupt several years, you know, decades ago. Um, 
the reclamation bond was woefully inadequate for this site and they ran out of money literally in about a year trying to put this thing away and they have an old leach pad up there that they capped um, all of their bad waste in there. The problem is, is the cap has holes in it and they can't quite figure out where the holes are at. So there's water perking through the old cyanide leach pad and started filling it up. So they ended up putting in a, a water treatment system up there and they're just kind of hanging on. They're trying to figure out how to fix this and get it, get it handled, but they don't have any money. So um, the chapter has been trying to lobby um, at the Forest Service level and even at the um, congressional level to get some Forest Service some funding for this because they need about $30 million to fix this right, and they've got none. So they have just enough to kind of maintain and operate this system as is. So there's some problems up there that we need to get fixed or else we're going to undo some of the good things that we've done um, downstream. So. Uh, you know, grazing management, fencing, I already kind of touched on that. That's a problem up there, and it, it really hurts the um, floodplain function and riparian function. So we'd like to see um, some better management there. I think we could develop some off-stream water sources to get those cows up out of the bottom a little bit and keep them off the, the riparian area. Um, and there were a couple more mining claims up there that we were unable to get. Uh, purchased as part of our grant. We just couldn't get the right people to agree. I'd like to get those. A couple of them are on the stream um, a little further up, so it'd be nice to pick those up. So still work to do, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was a really good project. Um, you'll know our trail. We got a couple of signs. We got a sign at the front end and the lower end, and uh, so you, it'll kind of point you in the right direction of getting on our trail. This was uh, Rich Projects when we were planting. We had the chapters out doing, um, did a bunch of willow planting and tree and shrub planting. Um, and then, you know, usually every year, we haven't done it in the last few years, but um, uh, we used to go down and once a year and walk the trail and whack out, you know, do maintenance on the trail. We'll probably do for that again, the chapter has. So they've stayed involved in this as well. So um, that's it, Robert. So. I would open it up for any questions if anybody has any. Fantastic place. My favorite. Yeah, isn't it neat? Great trail. I got the scars from the raspberries and the temperberries. <laughs> Well, they're gonna... Yeah, oh, oh, right there at the Peterson place. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a story there. Um, you know, we did a lot of research on that road in to our lower parking area, and all the research that we did uh, showed that it was public, but poorly recorded. Um, so, yeah, when the Greenway Trail came through, they had to negotiate with the landowner there on some other things, and I'm not really sure what's happened there. Uh, I don't know if it's permanent or if it, it may be. You know, a lot of times they'll shut that stuff down during the restoration phase when they seed and stuff because they don't want people running around with equipment. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been down and they try to run you off, and it's like, hey, it's public ground, you can't run me off. But <laughs> anyway, I hope that that gets uh, addressed soon. Worst case is that you know, you'll have, you may have to come up from Fairmont Road, which is another half mile or something to get up the low end, but I'm, I'm hopeful that that's gonna get addressed there and open back up. I don't, I know they just finished, you know, they're, they're done with all the removals. And then usually they come through with the trail after that. Um, they got the barrier done last year. I'm not really sure. I was thinking the next couple of years. The landowner agreements and easements and access really has bogged those guys down too. So they're quite a ways behind the cleanup. But all good questions. I, I don't. I don't know to be honest with you. So um, I was just curious. Like you said, you were struggling with like the riparian habitat. You know, did you guys? 
you sort of see mixed, you're just kind of like letting that the sediment kind of fill back in, like over the vent that cover and kind of replace that, or did you did you use that? Both. We we did plant uh, we did plant. We planted a bunch of willows, you know, 1,500 willow saplings and, and some cottonwoods, some, I, I don't know the species. We, we had an a, um, ecologist kind of help us with that, a reveg specialist. And so we planted them in the right areas. And then when we rebuilt the stream, you know, we created floodplain and tried to, you know, encourage those fine sediments, you know, whatever's left of them to deposit there and, uh, and then eventually stuff kind of takes off on its own and it's done pretty well I mean it's certainly not perfect when you have no fines in in the whole floodplain you know so we regraded it back to the appropriate geometry did the best we could and planted some stuff and it's come back pretty well oh so, yeah good question oh, yeah. Uh, That's a great question, and uh, you know, there are specific pieces of it that different folks, you know, uh, FWP agreed to sort of, well, the chapter committed to help maintain the trail for a period of five years, and then FWP had said that they would maintain it after that. They don't, it hasn't been maintained much by anybody other than us, but uh, the bridge uh, was a big issue. Who's going to maintain this bridge and take care of it? And so we ended up working in that agreement that the, the Greenway Service District took responsibility for the maintenance of that because they had several other bridges and accesses and such. Um, you know, all the stuff with the landowner, the landowner was responsible for that. Uh, and then that, those, were the, those were the major pieces. Um, you know, we... We had a kind of a maintenance fund for the stream, the pilot restoration, which we used when the thing blew out. We had to go back and do some channel maintenance and stuff. But um, now that the vegetation is kind of grabbed, it's really, you know, it doesn't really need any. But, um, but no, we, we did not have any long-term O&M funds. But good question. It's definitely something you got to think about on some of this stuff. So, yeah. Was somebody doing some? Not up there that I'm aware of. I know they've done it in other places in the in the watershed. Um, I don't think beaver. You know, there's one big beaver dam right down at the bottom that the landowner hates. Because <laughs> matter of fact, he would go up and uh, you know blow it up about every five years because it would start he wouldn't couldn't get enough water so but that's kind of the lad there's a little flat reach in there that is a really um you know it's a it's kind of a steep mountain you know b class stream and really not great beaver habitat in there um i haven't seen any anywhere other than than at the bottom there and so i, I don't know but it would be pretty difficult i would think for them to back some of that up, but there, there might be a couple of spots. Um, was the whole public access part required by the grant, or how did you guys decide on creating the trails and parking area? And all that? Uh, was not required. Uh, obviously, the, the, you know, they rank those grants. They, they do it differently now. They don't have this grants program anymore. They did a kind of an overarching tributary prioritization plan and now they they put money in specific areas based on that but uh, they like to spend money on public access and, and work on public ground versus private ground unless you can show a real significant public benefit to doing work on private ground but no I mean we just you know several of the members of the board had spent time up there and it's like man we got this, I mean, the, the bridge was a safety hazard and people were still trying to use it and, you know, somebody was going to go through it. And so we thought, you know what, let's, um, plus people were driving up there and they weren't supposed to be. So we're like, let's put in a, a new bridge and we'll, we'll limit the, the vehicle access and put a nice trail up there. So I, I think that was an idea that just kind of hatched as, as part of the project. So. <clears throat> Only the couples because of the mining, and then you 
rock in? What was it? Was it soil? Was it uh, you know what we did is right upstream uh, a couple hundred feet from the project there was uh, on our private ground because of course you couldn't dig on forest service ground um, there was a little uh, just on the hillside there we found a little spot where there was some it was just regular soil Robert I mean it was we didn't it was upper it, it had kind of you know it was stuff that had wasted off the hillside and kind of Piled up at the bottom there. Well, we yeah we we were required to have a, a pretty pretty robust weed plan. I mean we we had that. They, it's funny they would let us spray the areas that we did the work in, but they wouldn't pay to spray anything else outside, even though that was way worse. But. Um, yeah, just from a cost standpoint, we went upstream there and had the contractor just dig us, and we brought down you know as many truckloads as we could, and then we kind of reclaimed that and reseeded that and sprayed it for weeds. But yeah, I mean, this was you know 10, 12, 10 years ago. It was even. It's amazing how well, it's how just, yeah. Uh, even just yesterday, a day before, we experienced something that soil was introduced to our sites, and we didn't have weed problems. So it, weeds were in the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing how the science has continued to, to you know, ha, ha, if I were to go back and do this project again, there's so many things that you would do differently, you know. And, and, uh, but it's, it's fun to learn on the ground, so. What kind of invasive species do you find in this area? And how, how do you get rid of them? Uh, knapweed, awful. Knapweed is everywhere in Silver Bow County. Um, and we sprayed the heck out of it. Um, you know, one of the things we were worried about is that the, the lower, I would say like the lower half of the, the um, watershed, just lots of knapweed problems. The upper half, not so much. So we were a little bit worried about building our trail through there. The really, you had to, you had to really, hike it through there to get through there but with our trail we were worried about you know providing a kind of a corridor for people to drag weeds further up uh, up the gulch so we that's when we started um, working with DEQ we worked with one of the gals there and she was great and we're like hey man any way you could spray this for us because they sprayed the Silver Bowl Creek corridor anyway and she was great and she went up and um, we were able to really knock down the nap weed down on that bottom end and, and haven't had a huge problem up high. Also a little bit of leafy spurge up there too, which we did not, yeah, we were pretty nervous about that too. And so, um, yeah, we contracted with the same outfit that does the Silverbill Creek spraying to come up and spray our area. And they did it for five years. And actually they did it a couple of years after that just just because, but um, it's generally stayed fairly weed free. But you know, outside of your fence, there's you know they're eventually going to come back in. The hope is is that you get your native species to be able to get to the point where they can compete a little bit. Robert, you probably know a lot more about how that works than me, but uh, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And. Oh, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, I was just, uh, so with changing your uh, plans about the fish barrier, mm -hmm. did you take any steps, or did like Trout Unlimited take any steps to help the West Slope cuttings take hold in the upper part of Silver Oak Creek? Not hybridized, I guess, or? Well, so we were sort of, DEQ kind of had an unintentional barrier there anyway, so when they started that project, they started at Butte and came down and then kind of started at the bottom and started coming up. But the, the worry was is that um, when they started at the bottom and started coming up was that some of the stuff in the middle that they hadn't done, they'd get these big events and they'd wash tailings back into the areas that they'd already cleaned. So they put this big sediment basin, this big pond. You used to be able to see it right there as you were driving to Fairmont, you know, just just off to your left upstream and it really sort of acted as a fish barrier and we talked to the biologists and they're like yeah we're 
we're pretty uh, you know we're pretty confident that that's holding. Plus the the claim was is that the rainbows that were in there were actually sterile, so they the rainbows were coming out of the the ponds. They, they stocked those ponds, which is what are called triploid rainbow trout, so they're sterile, and so the ones we were seeing, everybody would freak out, and and you know the biologists would say, well, I'm pretty sure those are they shouldn't be shouldn't be able to reproduce. So um, so we we had a little bit of of level of comfort there that and the fact that they're I mean they're literally the fish weren't in Silverboat Creek I mean there were no fish in there and so so there was a little bit of a barrier via um, you know heavy metals <laughs> so we knew we had a little bit of time there and then you know once we kind of got the deal going to EQ to put the money towards that um, you know they got that in and then took out that that um, basin down below so um, good question but we kind of, by by talking to everybody, kind of determined that it wasn't a huge risk to do that ahead of time. And then, as far as the the cutthroat coming down, they've sort of we're relying on nature taking its course on that man. They've they've come down and uh, you know and now they can connect. So when it gets really hot and low water like it is now, they can come back out of Silverbrook Creek and go up into German Gulch Creek for for thermal refuge and then they can come back down um, and there's still problems with Silverboat Creek that aren't metals related I mean we have the Butte wastewater treatment plant discharge goes in there and it's really warm and even though they spent 35 million dollars there's nutrients are an issue there too um, it's certainly orders of magnitude better than it was but um, Butte is unique in that the, the receiving stream is so small that the impact of a, of a point source discharge like that is really big, and even of the urban area itself. I mean, Missoula discharges to the Clark Fork, and it's 5,000 CFS, and Billings is the Yellowstone, and you know, these are thousands, tens of thousands of CFS rivers, and, and Butte discharges to Silverboat Creek, which is five CFS, and so the the impacts are seen right away. Um, so, anyway. Thank you. I think we just finished and it was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. My pleasure.